Hi everyone, uh, we'll get started now. So, welcome to the first webinar of Analytics in the Maxim. We plan to host uh, Analytics thought leaders on a regular basis going forward. And today we have Dr. Bart Basin with us and we'll discuss the challenges when dealing with multiple channels of data and sculpting them into quantifiable value. And let me give a very quick introduction of Professor Bart. Professor Bart is a professor at KU Leeuwen, uh, Belgium and a lecturer at University of Southampton. I hope everyone can hear me. You dropped out basket for a moment there. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. So go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Probably go ahead. All right. So we. So Professor, I was giving an introduction of Professor Bart. So Professor Bart has done extensive research on analytics and uh, customer relationship management, web analytics, fraud detection, and uh, risk management. And he's well known in the industry. His finding has been published in well-known inter international journals, and he has presented at international top conferences as well. So he. He tutors with and advises very regularly, also provides consulting supports to international firms with respect to the analytics and risk management strategy. So, great to have you here, Bart. Uh, one point here that uh, you can ask questions anytime uh, by writing it down in the chat window at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and now over to you, Bart. Okay, great. Thanks, Basker, for... Um introducing me and for the invitation to organize this webinar. So welcome everybody. My name is Bart Balsens. Um, I'm a professor at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. I'm also connected to the School of Management at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. I'm currently based in Leuven in Belgium. Leuven is a small city. Actually, Belgium is a small country, definitely when you compare it to India. Leuven is about 20 kilometers away from Brussels, so you don't need a plane to go from Brussels to Leuven. Leuven is well known for a couple of things. It's uh, known for its university, which is the Catholic University of Leuven, founded in 1425, so it's a pretty old university. Uh, it's the best in the country, of course, because it's the place where I work, so I have to say it's the best, right? Besides, Leuven is also known for beer. You may have heard of Stella Artois which is a well-known Belgian beer. Many people know it outside Belgium, but I have to be honest, it's not the best Belgian beer. Most Belgians don't like it. Probably that's the reason why we export it. We do have a lot better beers in Belgium, but I cannot talk about beers today. I have to talk about advanced analytics in a big data world. So, as I already mentioned, I studied at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, obtaining my PhD in 2003 title Developing Intelligent Systems for Credit Scoring Using Machine Learning Techniques. Soon afterwards, I was contacted by SAS, the Statistical Analysis Software Company, to develop a course on credit risk modeling. I started teaching my first credit risk modeling course in 2004, and in the meantime, I've been teaching this course about 200 times worldwide. For some reason, and I actually don't know why, I never taught it in India. I've been teaching it in China, Australia, Japan, all over Asia. I've been teaching it all over Europe, in the United States, South America, but for some reason I never taught it in India. Recently, I developed an e-learning version of my credit risk modeling course. Besides credit risk modeling, I also work on analytics applied in other settings. When I say other settings, I'm referring to marketing, I'm referring to fraud detection, I'm referring to HR, I'm referring to um, uh, production and logistics, etc. Because analytics is my area of research. At the KU Leuven, I have a research team of about 10 PhD students and two postdoc students all working on analytics. Some of them work on very technical aspects, that means that they're going to study the development of new algorithms. Whereas other ones are going to work more application oriented. That means that they're going to study how those algorithms can be successfully adopted for fraud detection, 
insurance fraud detection, credit card fraud detection, for example, but also for churn prediction, response modeling, customer segmentation, customer lifetime value modeling, etc. If you want to stay up to date about the research events that we're organizing on analytics, please connect on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or on LinkedIn. I also have a very active uh, website, which is called dataminingapps.com. It still uses the outdated term data mining because we started the website about five years ago, and it's quite popular in the industry, so that's why we are not keen on changing the name thereof. If at the end of this presentation you're interested in more information, uh, please feel free to contact me at the email indicated at the bottom of the slide. Today I want to give you a very brief overview of some advanced analytics issues we have been working on. I will start by giving a talk and we'll first set the stage. We're going to talk about the analytics process model. We're going to discuss some key analytic model requirements and then zoom into some newer applications of analytics. This is partially based upon the research that we have been doing with various companies around the globe. More specifically, we will talk about social network analytics, which is very relevant if you're doing churn prediction in telco or if you're doing fraud detection. Think about anti-money laundering, for example. We'll talk about business process analytics, which is a quite new field of analytics which is gaining a lot of traction in the industry and then we'll say a few words about human resources analytics. I'll finish this course with a demo of an advanced analytics e-learning course that I have been developing together with SAS. It's a bunch of videos that we have recorded during the previous four months and which explain all the concepts of advanced analytics. Despite it being offered in collaboration with SAS, the e-learning course does not focus on the software, but rather on the concepts and modeling methodologies. But before we give the demo of the e-learning course, let's first start by setting the stage of analytics. Well, I'm sure I don't have to convince you of the fact that we're living in a data flooded world. Customers are going to interact with your firm by means of a diversity of different channels. Think about the online channel, for example. A customer can log on to your website, and by doing so, he or she leaves behind a massive amount of data ready to be analyzed. Not only the web, but also email is a very important communication channel. Customers can send you emails, ask for quotes, or maybe even file complaints. Call centers are also very important these days. And many of our call centers in Europe, as you know, are being outsourced to India. Every call center gathers a tremendous amount of information about a particular request. That request could be um, a quote for a price or maybe even a file or maybe even a complaint. Surveys are also a very important data collection mechanism. Every time you log on to a website these days, you have a message that pops up, and I don't like that very much personally, but anyway, you have a message that pops up that asks you about the visit experience, whether you like the information that was on the website, etc. We also have internally collected data, like corporate data. Think about transactional databases that store information about transactions, such as the time of the transactions, the number of items in a transaction, the type of items, uh, in a transaction, the location where the transaction was made, etc. Besides that, we also have data from partnering firms. Think about data poolers, for example. In the US, you have companies like Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, or Dun & Bradstreet, whose core business is collecting data and analyzing it and selling the results back to interested parties, such as firms, uh, banks, credit institutions, etc. All of this data presents you with a massive amount of information about customer behavior. And it's that information that we have to analyze using analytics. Now, analytics is basically a process. It involves various types of steps, and you can see them outlined here. First, you have to start by identifying the business problem. Do you want to detect fraud, or do you want to detect churn, 
or do you want to have customers respond to your marketing campaign? Whatever your marketing campaign is, is it an email campaign, is it a banner ad, or is it a catalog that you're sending out? First, you have to identify the business problem. Let's say that you're a telco operator and that you're interested in detecting churners. Once you have appropriately identified and defined the business problem, let's say churn detection, you have to identify various data sources that could potentially be helpful in solving the business problem. Be very careful, I say potentially helpful. The idea here is to gather as much as possible data that could be helpful to detect churn. Here I'm thinking about socio-demographic data. For example, the gender of the customer. Gender is a very important piece of information. Females and males behave totally different when it comes to churn, to default, or to fraud. But not only gender, also date of birth, employment status, physical address, etc. That's socio-demographic data. But ideally, you also want to combine it in a telco setting with call detail records. So every time you make a call, information of the call is stored into a huge log file, much like, much like a web log file. So the log file stores information about the start of the call, the end of the call, the caller, the callee, the type of information that is being exchanged like textual information, data-based uh, information, etc. So here you're going to identify all those data sources and then you're going to bring them together into a staging area. That staging area could be a data mart or a data warehouse. And the idea of that staging area is that it prevents, is that it presents a comprehensive view on all data available. Obviously, the data will be noisy. It will be contaminated with idiosyncrasies and weird things, like a customer whose age is 300 years old or a customer whose gender is missing. So that means that we have to clean up the data, take care of missing values, outliers, do some data filtering, etc. The next step will then be to enrich the data, transform the data. For example, based upon a customer's birth date, you can calculate age. Age is a derived data element. It's a data element that you calculate based upon a customer's birth date. Based upon the call detail record data that we referred to earlier, you can calculate the RFM variables. The RFM variables are very popular variables often used in churn prediction, response modeling, or customer segmentation. R stands for recency. How recent has it been since the customer made a call? F stands for frequency. How frequently is the customer using his or her mobile phone on a daily basis? M stands for monetary. What's the most recent, or well, let's say what's the average amount of that we charge the customer? Those are all examples of derived data elements that you can define during a transformation step. The next step then concerns analyzing the data. Here, you want to distinguish the churners from the non-churners using an analytical model. That analytical model could be a decision tree, a regression-based model, or maybe even a neural network for those of you that have heard of it. Once you have built your analytical model, you can start interpreting it, evaluating it, and deploying the model into your business environment. Your business environment could be a marketing environment, or it could also be a risk environment if you have developed a fraud detection model. So you can see that you have different steps here, and you're typically not going to go sequentially through this process model. It's iteratively. That means that during a particular step, you may find that it's worthwhile to go back one step to select more data or select different data or maybe add more features to the data. Roughly speaking, you can subdivide this whole analytics process model into pre-processing, analytics, and post-processing. Analytics is hard. Me and my research team, we are getting flooded by requests from the industry to collaborate on analytics. and we. We work in a variety of different areas. We work in fraud detection, like insurance fraud detection, credit card fraud detection. We do a lot of market basket analysis, like building recommender systems. Think of recommender systems 
as for Amazon, for example. Amazon is going to recommend books to you based upon the previous purchases that you make. They make a profile and then make target recommendations. Currently, we do a lot of social network analytics, and I will briefly mention that into more detail as we uh, proceed through the presentation. We've been doing churn prediction for financial institutions, but as well for telco firms. Response modeling, where you're going to see whether a customer is going to respond to a marketing campaign, yes or no. Customer segmentation. Customer lifetime value modeling, which is most probably the most ambitious type of marketing analytics that you can undertake. And obviously also web analytics, whereby you're going to study how customers interact with your website. What is the first page they see? That's the landing page. How do the visits look like? What's the average number of pages in a web visit? How long do they stay on your website? And where do they drop out? Or where do they bounce? So there's a lot of buzz going on in analytics these days. Here you can see a very simple example of a marketing application. I have a very small data set of only four customers, John, Sophie, Victor, and Laura, each characterized by means of four characteristics, the age and the RFM variables, recency, how long has it been since the customer made a purchase, frequency, how frequently is the customer making purchases, monetary, what's the average monetary amount. And then we have a target indicator, which is a churn indicator indicating whether the customer has churned yes or no. You can take this data set once you have pre-processed it and then put it into some kind of analytic software. And I frequently collaborate with SAS, but any other type of analytical software, IBM software or Microsoft software is fine. And then the purpose of the whole exercise is to build an analytical model like the one you see right here. This is a decision tree which can be automatically constructed based upon an underlying data set. It's an example of a white box analytical model because you can clearly see the thinking process, the reasoning process of the model. If the age is less than 40, yes, and the frequency is less than 5, yes, then the customer, according to the data, is most likely a churner. This is a decision tree, one of the most popular analytical models used in the industry. There, there are various steps involved in building a decision tree like this one, which I discussed in my advanced analytics course, for example. In the course, we then also go into more of the advanced stuff like random forests and boosting and bagging for those of you who may have heard of this. If you ask me, and actually I think Basker asked me at the start of this um, webinar, where do you see the most sophisticated applications of analytics these days? then I would have to say in risk management. When I say risk management, I'm talking about credit risk analytics. I'm talking about market risk analytics, like interest rate analytics. I'm talking about um, commodity price estimation, etc., but also operational risk. And the reason why the analytical models have been so important and so well developed in risk management is because of the impact they have in risk management. More than ever before, the analytical models steer the strategic decisions of banks because banks are going to set aside provisions and capital buffers to protect themselves against the expected and unexpected losses in the most optimal way. Now, the expected and unexpected losses are typically being quantified using analytics. From a credit risk perspective, for example, the losses are quantified by means of the PD, which is the probability of going into default on your loan obligation, the LGD, which is the loss given default, and the EAD, which represents the outstanding exposure. All these three parameters are typically quantified, estimated using analytics. So a bank will calculate the expected and unexpected losses using analytics, and it needs provisions and equity buffer to protect itself, but also its savings depositors, in other words, us all together, from all these risks. And that's why there has been very strict regulation relating to the development of these models. You may have heard of the Basel II, Basel III, Solvency II Accords, which are in essence analytical accords. 
If you do an analytical modeling exercise, you're going to see that you have various people that need to collaborate because, in essence, analytics is a multidisciplinary exercise. You're going to have the database or data warehouse administrator. He or she is responsible for gathering the data and for providing us with the key ingredient of the analytical exercise, which is data together with the data definitions. Then we have the business expert, and I'm sure that we're having lots of business experts on the call today. Marketeers, credit risk analysts, fraud analysts, etc. We have the legal expert. The legal expert will inform us about what data cannot be used and what data can be used for analytics. Think about privacy concerns or ethical concerns, for example. And then we have the data scientist, which is now the sexy term for what we used to call data miner. And then obviously we have the software or tool vendors. So here you clearly see that a multidisciplinary team needs to be set up. People often ask me, and I recently wrote some blogs on this, what is the ideal profile of a data scientist? What are the key skills that the data scientist should possess? Well, I believe the first key skill is statistics or quantitative modeling. Whether it's statistics or data mining or machine learning, the distinction between all those disciplines is getting more and more blurred and is no longer relevant to the discussion. But besides statistics, data scientists should also excel in ICT skills, and I believe that is programming. Programming in Java, R, SAS, Python, the programming language is less relevant as long as you understand the basic concepts of programming. That's why I also recently wrote a book on this. Data scientists need to need to collaborate with lots of business people and lots of people in the organization. That's why they should also excel in communication and visualization. Finally, they should also possess a sound business knowledge, whether it's marketing, risk management, fraud, etc. They should be aware of the business processes and understand them. And obviously, data scientists should be creative. They should see how they could leverage new technology. Think about the Internet of Things, for example, which is going to have a huge impact on big data and analytics, if you ask me. Well, a data scientist needs to be able to creatively think about how to leverage this to create at a business value. Data is the key ingredient to any analytical exercise. I already mentioned that, and it's of key importance that the data is of good quality. It's never going to be of perfect quality. If you're going to wait until the data is of perfect quality before you start doing analytics, you are never going to get anything done. However, it is important that we have programs in place that evaluate data in terms of data quality and that actually set up improvement strategies. If you start from bad data, you're never going to get good analytical models. This is what we call the GIGO principle, garbage in, garbage out. Throughout our collaborations or research partnerships with various firms in the industry, we have found that simple analytical models typically perform very well. When I say simple analytical models, I'm referring to regression-based models like linear and logistic regression or decision trees. Those typically give you a very good benchmark performance. So if you really want to further boost the performance of your analytical models, you should not work at fine-tuning those techniques, but you should improve the ingredients thereof. Hence the importance of master data management and data quality. The first investment that you should make if you want to increase the performance of your analytical models is in data, not that much in analytical techniques. When we say data quality, obviously that is a concept that has multiple dimensions related to it. We're thinking about data accuracy like somebody's age is 300 years or income is 1 million euros, both are weird values that require further inspection. I'm not only talking about data accuracy, I'm also talking about completeness, I'm talking about data bias and sampling, data definition, data recency, latency. In fact, I have one PhD student that works with a firm in terms of data quality. And here you can see all the dimensions listed I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you can see things like accuracy, completeness, the data should be value added, should be relevant, should be easily understandable, etc. 
Next, once we have our data all sorted out, we can start doing analytics. And roughly speaking, you can make a distinction between predictive analytics and descriptive analytics. Predictive analytics means that you want to predict a particular type of data attribute. That data attribute could be categorical, like a churn indicator, a response indicator, or a fraud indicator. When that is the case, we have a classification exercise. You want to classify customers as churners, yes or no, as fraudsters, yes or no, as responders, yes or no. But the target attribute can also be continuous. Think about CLV, which stands for Customer Lifetime Value. Or think about LGD, which I already mentioned before in credit risk modeling. Remember, LGD stands for loss given the fault. These are continuous targets that can take on any value on a particular interval. So in predictive analytics, you always have a target variable. This is not the case in descriptive analytics. In descriptive analytics, you have a bunch of data items, call it attributes or inputs, which, equal, which each play an equal role. Popular examples of descriptive analytics are clustering, clustering your customers, doing customer segmentation in other words, association rules to detect what products or services are frequently purchased together, or to detect what web pages are frequently visited together, or sequence rules which are going to detect sequences of product purchases or sequences of web page visits. What distinguishes sequence rules from association rules is the timing aspect. Association rules do not take into account time. Sequence rules look at the time at which particular purchases were made or web pages have been visited. Now, in our research partnerships with various firms, we often get various types of analytic model requirements. What are the key requirements of a good analytical model? Well, if you ask me, I would say business relevance. The first one is that the analytical model should solve your business problem. If your business problem is fraud detection, then the analytical model should detect fraud. If the business problem is detecting responders, then the analytical model should detect responders. This sounds obvious, but this is not always that obvious as it sounds. In response modeling, we have a major difference between cross-lift, which is the response, the customers that respond to the marketing campaign, and net lift, which is the customers that respond because of the marketing campaign. Those are totally different concepts, and it's very important that you understand those clearly. Obviously, the analytical model should also tell us about what patterns are present in the data. In other words, it should tell us a meaningful statistical pattern. So, the analytical model should have good statistical performance. And I actually have two PhD students just working on this. But these are only two dimensions. Analytical models, depending upon the setting, should also be interpretable and justifiable. In credit risk modeling, we cannot use neural networks, for example. Why not? Because in credit risk modeling, the analytical models are subject to supervisory review. I don't know what the local supervisor is in India, but I think it could be the Bank of India. Let's say it's the Bank of India which will validate the analytical models to estimate PD, probability of default, LGD, loss given default, and ED of the Indian banks. So in order for them to be able to appropriately validate them, the model should be interpretable. So interpretability is also very important. Operational efficiency means how much time do we need to build the model, evaluate it, and re-estimate it if necessary. Recently, we've been working with a firm in uh, Europe for uh, using social networks for credit card fraud detection, and there they said that the analytical model should be able to make a decision whether a transaction is fraudulent, yet, less or, yes or no, within six seconds. That's operational efficiency. Obviously, the models should also be evaluated from an economical perspective. We need to evaluate them in terms of the total cost of ownership, what are the acquisition costs, what are the ownership costs, what are the post ownership costs, and in terms of the revenue that they generate. Obviously, the latter is much harder to quantify than the former. Or in other words, revenue is much harder to quantify than total cost of ownership. And finally, where appropriate, analytical models 
should also comply with regulations, privacy regu regulations, ethical guidelines, or even guidelines such as the Basel or Solvency Act. Now, once you have an analytical model that satisfies the necessary requirements according to the problem field and the study, you will also have to do some post-processing. When I say post-processing, I'm talking about sensitivity analysis, deploying the model into a business setting, making sure it is represented in a user-friendly way, using mechanisms such as scorecards, for example, or maybe even traffic lights. The model should then also be monitored and backtested because the average lifespan of an analytical model highly depends upon the context in which it was developed, but I would say it will not be longer than two or three years because the environment is changing so quickly. So after two or three years, you will need to um, re-estimate your model. How to decide when to optimally rebuild your model is part of a model monitoring and backtesting exercise. This is a, a very small background setting. And based upon that, I'd like to now zoom into some of the more exciting newer research projects that we have been working on. And one of them is social network analytics. And when I say social networks, many of you probably think of Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Well, I can tell you social networks is more than that. Actually, we don't use a lot of Facebook, Twitter, and, Twitter and LinkedIn. Why? because we're not sure about the privacy regulation there. If you talk to many regulators worldwide, they are still very vague when it comes to what information on Twitter you can use for analytics. When we talk about social networks, we're thinking of a network of nodes, and the nodes can be customers, the nodes can be companies, they can be bank accounts, they can be credit cards, which are linked in a particular way. Linked by means of telephone calls, for example. If you would apply it in a telco setting, you can think of a network as customers calling each other, and the link is just a call. The link can also be weighted because you can make a distinction between customers calling each other on a daily basis or customers calling each other on a weekly basis. The links or the nodes can also be web pages, web pages connected by hyperlinks. They could be um, companies connected by resources. And when I say resources, I'm talking about physical address, I'm talking about employees, or maybe even equipment. So there's lots of different ways of defining a network. And one of the key challenges when you do network analytics is actually defining a network. We've applied it successfully in two settings. The first one is telco. In telco, you will see that firms or telco firms are going to detect churn using two pieces of information. Think of the customer Bart being connected to Basker, Basker being connected to David, David being connected to Sophie, and so on. All of us are part of a, a one particular type of telecom company, let's say British Telecom. First type of information to use when you do churn prediction is customer-specific information, if you have that available. So here I'm thinking about Bart's specific individual information, like Bart's gender, that's already very important, Bart's age, um, whether Bart makes international calls, yes or no, the number of times that Bart has called the help desk, yes or no, etc. This is what we call local individual information. But besides this local individual customer information, you can also make use of social network information. You can look at Bart's friends, Basker, David and Sophie, and take into account their information when uh, detecting churn for BART. And here on my next slide, you can see a small video that I'm going to show you of a real-life social network. So here you can see, this is just a dump from a, a real-life call graph from a telco firm that we collaborated with. And you can see, can I just pause it? Yep, I'm not pa pausing it. So you see the blue nodes represent customers, and now uh, we're going to show churners in the graph. So you can see the red dots represent churners. Right? Now let's now proceed with the analysis. Now we're going to continue and let the graph grow chronologically in time. So now you can see more churners, more churners, more churners in the graph as time proceeds. And here you can see two churners closely related. Probably one influenced the other, indicating that there's a social network effect. You can see more churners, and at some point, you're going to see chain effects. That means that one tuner 
who's going to influence an entire chain of customers because of the network they have in between. You can see that the churn behavior is getting more and more concentrated in the network. And now we can zoom in. So here you can already see these are three churners probably influencing each other. Let's further zoom in. So you can see a whole chain effect. See, these are all customers closely related because they're positioned next to each other in the network. And one of them churned, and actually instead of one customer churning, the, customer, the company ended up in having, I don't know, let's say 10 or more customers churning. Because of the social network effect, because of this one guy influencing all the others. Clearly, this is highly undesirable. And we built social networks in Telco to actually de detect this with very nice lift values. And currently, we also use it for fraud detection. We worked with the Belgian government, but we're, not, but, but we're also now working with a credit card provider to actually come up with a social network for fraud detection. And remember, I told you, when you do social networks, the first thing is to define a network. And here we looked at companies, which are the nodes, and the links or shared resources. You can think of a resource as an employee that is being shared between two companies, a shared director, a shared C-level executive, or also a shared physical address or a shared or some shared equipment. We actually built a network like that and then we started to investigate how fraud propagates in the network. The red nodes are fraudulent nodes, all the non-red nodes or the green nodes are non-fraudulent nodes. We can then see how fraud propagated in the network. And to model this optimally, we actually made use of the Google PageRank algorithm. Google PageRank is also looking at a network of web pages whereby one page has an influence on all the connected pages in terms of their relevance. We use that same mechanism here to detect fraud. And we found it to be very powerful and see how fraud in one particular network is going to contaminate all the other nodes in the network. Here you can see or gotcha algorithm or methodology that we recently introduced. I'm not going to go through it because I don't have time, but if you go to our YouTube channel, we have a presentation on it. But we made use of different types of data sources like factual data, historical data, transactional data to build a network which we then summarized into direct network attributes and indirect network attributes and combined that with local attributes or other words, node specific attributes. We then gave it to a learning algorithm which was able to detect fraud. And here you can see some of the performance benchmarks that we achieved in social security fraud and credit card fraud. You can see that most of the times, the techniques that we're using to detect fraud or logistic regression, which is interpretable, decision trees, which is also interpretable, or random forests. Random forests are less interpretable but highly performing. Throughout all our empirical and research collaborations with firms, we have found that random forest beats all the rest. So if you're interested in a black box model, if you don't care about interpretability, but only interested in model performance, then random forest is the way to go. This is just one application that we've been working on. Another one is process analytics. And here we start seeing some business interest in it, although I would say that the domain is not fully mature yet. But the idea here is to start from a log of an information system. Here you can see to the left a log of an information system. It could be a web log actually. And the log stores, stores information about different activities which have taken place at a particular timestamp together with the originator. So this is the information that you get from a web log or a log from an information system. And using techniques, analytical techniques, which we have developed in our group, but also elsewhere in the world, you can actually build models. Models that are going to tell you what is happening in your log. What is the sequence of activities taking place in your log? Make order form is the first, then scan invoice, then central registration. This can either be re rejected, accepted, and so on. So it gives you a very attractive overview of all the activities, which ones take place in parallel depending upon the outcome of which other ones, etc. This is process analytics. I think that there's going to be a huge potential for it in the next, I would say, five to ten years. Right now, we see some companies experimenting with it, 
but it's definitely not mainstream analytics yet. Another area where we do see a lot of interest in these days is HR analytics, using analytics for human resources activities. Here I'm talking about employee churn, employee performance, employee absence, or even employee satisfaction. And many of the ideas that we have developed earlier in CRM or marketing analytics can be successfully also uh, transposed to HR analytics. Whether you're talking about employee or customer churn is basically the same, except the data is different. So right now we're collaborating with some firms in Europe on the topic of HR analytics. He can see, for example, an absenteeism scorecard, which is a scorecard which has been built to actually quantify the number of days an employee will be absent. So you can see that the scorecard makes use of various types of characteristics like age, function, department, each of them has been categorized into a few categories and points are being associated. The points originate from the data and have been estimated by means of the analytical model. The more points are assigned to a category, the more days the employee will be absent. And then you can use that in your decision support systems to evaluate the number of days that an employee is going to be absent. This is an example of a white box analytical model. And similar models have been built for application and behavioral credit scoring for those of you that are familiar with it. So in this, in this webinar, we started by setting the stage and we briefly discussed a few examples from marketing and risk management analytics. We spoke about the analytics process model as data pre-processing, analytics and post processing, zoomed into the analytical model requirements such as business relevance, statistical performance, interpretability, operational efficiency, economical cost, and a, a regulatory compliance. And we also zoomed into some newer applications like social networks, business process analytics, and HR analytics. I would now like to point to you some further sources of information because I realized that I gave you a lot of information in this condensed uh, time frame. Background information is important. So here you can see an overview of my publication list and if you would like to have a nice overview of all publications, please go to my website, dataminingapps.com. I also, here you can see actually a, a screenshot from our dataminingapps.com website. Please feel free to visit. I recently published a few books on it. Here, this one is on credit risk analytics. This one we published in 2008. I told you that a data scientist should also perfection him or herself in programming. That's why we also wrote a book on Java programming, the basics of programming. This is a book that we published about a month ago. My most successful book nowadays is Analytics in a Big Data World. We have been selling this one more than 3,000 times worldwide now, and this is my most popular one. One that I finished two weeks ago, but which is not available yet, is Fraud Analytics using descriptive, predictive, and social network techniques. This one will be available from September onwards. But if you would like to have more information about it, I'm more than happy to refer you to some of the courses that I'm teaching. Here you can see that some of the courses that I'm teaching together with SAS. And as I already mentioned, despite the courses being offered together with SAS, they do not focus on the software, but they focus on the concepts and modeling methodology instead. SAS is only used for demo purposes and actually, at, on average, we have about half of my participants that do not use SAS, but use R, MATLAB, or SPSS. You see that we have courses on credit risk modeling, a one-day course on analytics, putting it all to work, an advanced three-day course, advanced analytics in a big data world, a web analytics and web intelligence course, and then also a fraud analytics course using descriptive, predictive, or social network learning. We basically teach those courses both in classroom version. This has been my most recent project. Advanced analytics in a big data world, turning it into e-learning. And what does that mean, e-learning? I'm going to give you a very small demo of this. E-learning means that the course is being offered on the internet as a self-paced e-learning of about more than 20 hours of videos, demos, scripts, and quizzes. The videos can be played as many times you want during one year. 
So if you would register for the course, you get access to all videos during one year, and you can play them, replay them as many times as you want. No SaaS software is needed. You only need a laptop or an iPad or an iPhone with a web browser. And you also get a certificate. I'm going to give you a demo of my most recent course, which I put into e-learning, which is my advanced analytics course. So I just go to SaaS, the SaaS website, www.saas.com, and I will log in with my profile information. Okay. So now I already logged in uh, because SAS remembered my credentials and I go to training and now I go to my training and here you can see various types of e-learning courses. I've developed two of them myself, credit risk modeling and um, here advanced analytics in a big data world. This is currently my most successful one. So let's just quickly show how this works. So upon registration, this is the start screen that you will get and you can then start the course, right? And you will see that the course has been subdivided into lessons, the analytics process model, decision trees, ensemble methods like backing, boosting, random forests, also rule representation, neural networks, support vector machines, Bayesian networks, survival analysis, which is also a very important analytical technique, which we do see a lot of interest in these days, social networks, and monitoring analytical models. I'm just going to quickly go into some of them. Let's go into neural networks. You can see a whole bunch of movies to actually explain to you what neural networks are, right? We go into all movies are actually about two to three minutes in size, and you can play them as many times as you want. Let's just play this one, for example. This is on rule extraction. You can, it's actually a video playing right now, so it has sounds. You will not hear the sound right now because I'm using my headset to talk to you. But if you would play this on your, uh, on your computer, obviously you will hear the sound. Every, every movie is also subtitled, so I'll show you the subtitling. You can fast forward the movies. You can also ask for the text of every movie, that this is actually the text of this movie, right? Which you can read as many times as you want. And we also have quizzes, right? To make sure that you pay attention, you will see quizzes that you have that come with the movie. We also have demos in SAS. You can see a demo on using self-organizing maps, which are a special type of neural networks for clustering. But obviously, let me just pause it. But obviously, if you don't use SAS, you can just skip the demos if you want. There's also, just to give you social networks, we've been talking about social networks for churn. Here you can see all the applications, but into a lot more detail. So here we give uh, how social networks can be built for fraud detection, for credit card fraud detection, for example. Um, we do give a lot, a lot more details. We talk about social network metrics. We talk about community mining. We talk about iterative classification or the boot or the Google PageRank algorithm and how you can use how you can use the Google PageRank algorithm for fraud detection, right? So here we give a lot of detail, actually, and as I told you, every movie is subtitled and has the text. Here you can see the text that comes with this movie and some of the formulas. Of course, this is not a mathematical course, so there's not plenty of formulas, but if we include formulas, it means that we think it's important to be aware of those formulas before you can use the technique in a business setting. We give our, our gotcha fraud detection tool that we developed in research and that is now being used by a credit card and a social security company. We uh, also discuss that into more detail as a case study in uh, the lesson. Um, there's also plenty of helps and resources and at the end of the course you also get a course certificate that you can uh, print out. This is a project, it's a, it's a e learning course for free. It's not for free because we spend about we spent about four months developing it, right? So I had to develop we had to develop all those movies, we had to put them into production, we had to edit them, etc. The course is not for free. How much does it cost? 
If you're interested, you can send me an email and I can get you into contact with SaaS India. It is being sold on the internet uh, by means of your local SaaS country. So either you go on the internet, you, uh, you go to the link that is being provided here, right? This is the link that you can go to. You, um, and there you will find the price. If it's not mentioned there, it will actually have an email address mentioned there that you can uh, use to mail your local SaaS representative. This is my advanced analytics in a big data world course, which has been available now for about two weeks. Uh, another course which is available since the beginning of uh, November last year is credit risk modeling. So if you're into PD, LGD, and EAD modeling and validation, then this is a course which is going to also discuss the whole trajectory of PD, LGD, EAD modeling, validation, and stress testing. Okay, so this is where uh, if you would have, if you would require more information about this, feel free to drop me an email or let me know. I hereby I would like to conclude this very brief webinar whereby we went into some basic stuff relating to analytics in a big data world and I ended with a uh, demo of my e-learning course. Does anyone have any questions? More than happy to take your questions now. Look forward. Let's see where I, I can show you my video so you have to see it. I'm not sure whether this is going to add anything exciting for you, but at least I could try webcam. Okay. You see me now? Yes. <laughs> Great. Not sure whether this adds something, but okay. The first, the first two people that ask me a question can get a free copy. Of my advanced of my analytics in a big data world book, I'll send it to you, free copy, and I'll sign it. I'm not sure whether this is going to add any value for you, but I'll sign it. So if you ask me, first two people that ask me a question. Anyone interested in asking me a question? I'll give you a couple seconds, whatever question. I've, I mean, I've never had a stupid question. Look at this one. There's one? That's two. Two questions. First two people that asked me a question get a free signed copy of my book. I can't see the Okay. There were two questions, Pascal? Yes, there are in fact a lot. In fact, people have asked a lot of questions. Uh, interesting oh, that you can't see it. Questions on the first two I get. You can make a random drawing yourself. So the first question is by Nepal Patel, and, and it's, can you share some example of analytics, please? Share some examples of analytics. Well, yeah. Um, I mean. Credit risk analytics, whereby you're going to use analytics to predict whether a customer is going to default on his or her loan obligation. That could be an installment loan. That could be a, a car loan. That could be a mortgage. That could be a credit card. So analytics is very popular there. But also um, just a market basket analysis, whereby you're going to use analytics to see what products of, uh, or services are frequently purchased together. So on Amazon to see what books are frequently purchased together. These are just two popular examples of analytics. Like, there's plenty of more. You can think of web analytics. You can think of social media analytics where analytics is being used to study what people are saying about your products on Twitter, on Facebook. For example, I've collaborated with a, a pharmaceutical firm that was studying, that was using social media analytics to see what people are saying about the drugs that they're selling on Twitter, on Facebook to better understand the side effects of the drugs that they were selling. Just, these are just some examples. Okay? All right. And okay, uh, thanks for that question. So the person that asked me that question, please send me an email with your mailing address where I can send you the book. You, you've, you've earned your free book. Another one, the second one. Second one, but is how we can, I think it's by AJ, and he's asking how can we get the data about social media? From, from social media? 
uh, about social networks. From social networks, social networks, or social media? Social networks. Social networks. Well, the data you get is uh, depends a bit on the context that you're working in. In Telco, we got our data from CDR logs. So I told you that every time a customer makes a phone call, the data is being stored into a huge CDR log. It's a call, CDR stands for so Call Detail Record, and it contains the the name of the caller, the name, uh, sorry, the number of the caller, the number of the callee, start of the call, end of the call, etc. And we had to extensively pre-process that log. That's why I told you that programming is very important if you want to be a good data scientist and build a network. How did we represent the network? We represented the network as a matrix, whereby uh, the columns and uh, the rows and the columns indicated the customers and the cells indicated a connection. And every connection was weighted as the number of seconds two people spoke to each other on the phone during the previous three months. In fraud detection, we built the network ourselves based upon um, all the data that was available about companies and the way they shared resources. But building, this is actually a very good question, because building a network requires a lot of effort. But once you have it, you're rich, because then you can start to use it for fraud, for churn, or for whatever type of analytics you want, would like to use it. Thanks. So the second question, this person, please do also send me your physical mailing address and I'll send you a signed copy of my book. I have no more books to give away because otherwise my publisher will complain. But I'm more than happy to take on more questions. I think there are a lot more questions. I'll take up a few of them. But so Janice is asking, did you ever saw a random forest model for credit decisions? Did I say that again? Did, did, you, did you ever saw a random forest model for credit decisions? No. That's a very good question. I never saw a random forest being used for credit risk decisions. Why? Because analytical credit risk models need to be white box. They are validated by local supervisors, I believe in India, the Bank of India, and random forests are basically not allowed there. I have seen random forests being used in settings where interpretability is not a key concern. And here I'm talking about fraud analytics, so I've seen it being used for credit card fraud detection and for marketing response modeling. Good question. Okay. Uh, there's another one which is, what credit risk modeling technique would you suggest for microfinance? Well, we've been working on microfinance, and I think in, a, in a, how is that bank in India called again with the guy that kind of won the Nobel Prize? Is Pradeen? No, it's the Grameen Bank. The Grameen Bank is a well-known right. bank, I think, which is specialized in microfinance in, right. uh, in India. Yeah. And um, we've been doing some, not some work with Grameen Bank, but we've been doing some work with uh, a bank in um, the Balkan region in the southern part of Europe on uh, microfinance, and, and you can also see that on my website. Very simple. We use a regression method there, and that's also the regression, that's also the method that I would recommend. I would re recommend you use the logistic regression method, logistic regression technique to build your microfinance credit risk model. Logistic regression is also the mainstream analytical technique. In Western Europe, for example, me today, I've been subjected to at least four credit risk models. I mean, I have two credit cards. I have one from the KU Live and I have one private credit card. And both of those credit cards I know today have been credit scored by means of a logistic regression model because I know the, what the bank is using in terms of analytics. Um, I have a mortgage as well. So my, my bank today where I have a mortgage will put me into a logistic regression model to see whether I'm likely to go into default in the next one year, yes or no. Hopefully not, but they will score me. And my telco provider will also see on my mobile phone, which you can see right here, which is unfortunately broken, whether I'm likely to churn in the next three months. So logistic regression is undoubtedly the most popular analytical model, and as such, also very useful for microfinance. Good question. All right, great. More? Uh, yep. Uh, so this is a question by Sunny. Uh, would there be significant potential for fraud analytics using SaaS in the gaming and betting industry in the UK and other global gambling industry markets? I, um, I cannot answer that question very precisely because uh, I have not been doing work in gaming and uh, betting industry myself. 
VPN. I know that SAS has a separate, I'm not that much much SAS tied. I, the only thing is I use SAS to collaborate for course development, but I'm not that much tied to the software. I know that they have a solution which is targeted at casinos, right? To, because in Las Vegas, they have lots of casinos there, which also gather lots of data about fraud, etc. And I know they have a solution that particularly addresses that. So you may want to have a look at their website and see what they're doing there. But I know one thing that in terms of fraud, and I don't want to do a sales pitch for SaaS because I don't have, uh, besides them offering my course, I don't have any uh, relationship in terms of products. But I know they have a, a product which is called Social Network Analytics, SNA, which is being used a lot right now for fraud detection. So the only thing is there that you need to think about how to construct the network. And in gaming and betting industry, I don't have any experience myself, to be honest. So I would have to first clearly understand the business problem before I can start thinking about building a network and then putting it into the SAS social network analysis software for analytics. Okay. And I think this is, I'll, we'll take this as the last question. So there's a question by Shiv, and okay. he's asking, what is the scope of an analytics in e-commerce today? Oh, in e-commerce, it's, uh, I mean, you can use a lot in e-commerce. You can, um, the recommender says, well, first of all, you could do web analytics, first of all. Web analytics means if a customer is going through your e-commerce purchasing process, how is he going through it, right? So first you have a process that says, add item to cart, right, so to your market basket. But how do customers get there? Where do they get there? How do they proceed through the purchasing process? That's sequence analysis, and some firms use sequence analysis to see if a, fir if a, if a customer logs onto your website, starts composing all the items of the market basket with a cart, then how many of them that start actually finish and pay, right? And you can use analytics to see where people drop out and why they drop out. You can use sequence analysis to do that. Besides that, you can also use um, recommender systems to as people start adding items to their cart to actually give them targeted recommendations about what other types of items they might be interested in. And last but not least, you can also look at fraud analytics because as, customer, as a customer is making an online payment, you want to make sure that it's a that it's not a fraudster. So you can actually do a fraud analytics um, model to um, get an idea about the, uh, whether it's a genuine customer or whether it's, a le whether it's a legitimate customer or whether it may be a prankster or a fraudster. Okay? All right. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Bart. I think it was very informative. Uh, Basker, I also would like to thank you. I think, uh, I mean, I got into touch with you a couple of months ago. I think you're doing a, a great job in India by um, uh, uh, keeping people educated about what's going on on analytics. So, uh, you know, Basker is doing the analytics in India magazine, which is not only a magazine, but also a website. And I've been fortunate to also contribute to the website with a, with a few blogs and interviews. So. To everybody that attended, I can definitely recommend it because I think there's some good stuff on there um, if you want to stay up to date about new developments in the field. So thank you very much for doing that. I think uh, this is a great effort. Thank you and thanks everyone for attending this. This is a, a recording and uh, this recording will be posted on the Analytics in the Magazine. And feel free to send us email, me and Bart. I, you can write to me at info at Analytics in the Magazine or you can reach out to Bart as well. So thanks, thanks a lot. Awesome, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.